This is OMS Voices, an Amos podcast. I'm Bill Klaproth, and with me is Dr. Caitlin McGue, who is here to discuss recovering from wisdom teeth surgery. Dr. McGue, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's nice to meet you guys. Yeah, thank you so much. So first of all, what are wisdom teeth? So wisdom teeth are basically the third set of molars. Uh, They are the last teeth to come in inside the mouth. Well, theoretically, they're the last teeth to develop. They may not always come in. So that's part of what we'll be talking about today, I guess. But wisdom teeth are often impacted, and that's why we often need to get them removed. Why do we call them wisdom teeth? I'm just curious. I just... It's a good question. So wisdom teeth usually come in between the ages of 17 and 25. And at some point, that used to be called the quote-unquote age of wisdom. Okay. And that's where that came in, not because they make you smarter by any means. So, <laughs> Well, you're a historian, seeing we're, we're learning so much already. I love it. So when do they come in and, and why do we have them? So like I mentioned, they start to develop around the ages of 17 to 25, although We definitely see variations in that. Sometimes people are younger, sometimes they're older, and sometimes people are lucky and don't even get all of them or Mm -hmm. any of them. But they are kind of an old relic of a time when we used to need them. Obviously, nowadays, most people don't, and that's why we often see them getting impacted or not fully coming into the mouth. Do they always have to come out? So not always. Okay. We typically want to have a plan by the age a patient is 25, whether or not we're planning to keep them or remove them. It seems that if they do fully erupt into the mouth and they are functional, that oftentimes we can allow patients to hang on to those teeth. But we do tend to see later on as patients get older or patients start to have problems with dexterity, that hygiene becomes a big issue. And eventually patients often need those taken out, even if when they're younger, they're functional and no issues are happening. So generally they'll cause problems if you don't get them out. Typically, not always. You know, everyone's different, and there are definitely cases where people will keep them for their lifetime. Yeah. So is it generally our teenage years when they come out? Typically, if they're going to start to erupt, it will be kind of late teenage years, early 20s, sometimes, like I said, a little bit later, sometimes a little bit earlier. But usually, like I was saying, we want to have a decision about whether or not we're going to remove them or keep them by the time a patient's 25, just because patients tend to heal better and recover quicker when they're younger. So if we're going to remove them, we try to do it when that healing is going to be at its best. Absolutely. So do you know ahead of time that these are going to have to come out, or is it symptomatic when a person is feeling pain, like, "Uh uh-oh, it's time? How do you judge that? That's a good question, too. So ideally, we would want to get them out before a patient becomes symptomatic. You know, unfortunately, we will often see patients show up in the emergency room or coming in for urgent dental appointments because of pain or in even worst case scenarios, infections that have led them to get swollen or have systemic symptoms like fever and nausea and things that we don't really want our patients to experience. So oftentimes we'll try to recommend getting them out before they become a problem for everyone's benefit. And again, in the setting of infection or pain or symptoms, it changes the recovery in the surgery. So you mentioned eruption of the tooth. Is that when it breaks the skin or the gum, I should say? Exactly, yes. So erupting or coming into the mouth is basically when the tooth starts to come through the gums. And then if it's, quote unquote, fully erupted, that means it's basically fully out through the gums into where it should be in alignment with the other teeth. Okay, got it. So for a parent listening to this, what should a teen do to prepare in the days before the surgery to help have a smooth recovery? So... It really depends on how far out from your consultation appointment to your extraction appointment or your Mm -hmm. surgical appointment. If your pre-surgical or consultation appointment is weeks out, probably not going to need to make a lot of changes right at that point in time. But always listen to what your oral and maxillofacial surgeon is telling you. Follow their recommendations. That's probably the most important piece of information. Sometimes oral surgeons will prescribe medications prior to the surgery appointment. If that's the case, always recommend picking those up beforehand. Saves you time on the day of surgery. It's one less stop you have to make on the way home. And you can kind of work out any problems that you may have with picking up those prescriptions beforehand as well, which can be really helpful for patients and parents on the day of surgery. So on the day of surgery, how should the teenager or child prepare? Again, most of it revolves around paying attention to what your oral and maxillofacial surgeon is telling you. Big things that I really think are important on the day of surgery, though, are really adhering to the food and drink guidelines that your surgeon gives you. Because depending on the type of anesthesia that you're having, you may or may not be able to eat or drink anything the day of surgery. And that's really a big safety issue. And that's why your surgeon is making those recommendations, 
not because we're mean, not because we're worried about you having food in your teeth. It, it really comes down to safety. Right. So that's one of the big things. The other one that we often talk about is medication management. There are certain medications that patients are taking at home mm-hmm. that we will either recommend that they continue or that they discontinue on the day of surgery. And again, that comes down to safety issues. So, Right. So then after wisdom tooth surgery, what's the recovery like? What foods should a patient avoid? Those types of things. So recovery is obviously variable depending on the person, the situation, but most patients are feeling back to normal in about a week or so. Some patients recover a lot quicker than that, but I would say usually a couple of days, maybe two to three days, you're going to probably not feel up to doing a whole Mm -hmm. lot and you should probably take it easy for that short period of time. I would recommend, you know, stay away from hard, sharp, pokey foods, Right. anything that can kind of get down into where the teeth were taking out. We try to avoid those things. Or if you have stitches, we want to make sure nothing's going to get underneath those stitches. And then soft foods are obviously better for people. And that's a comfort issue. And then I always recommend to my patients, just avoid spicy foods. Mm -hmm. And again, not necessarily because it's going to hurt anything besides you feeling more uncomfortable. Yeah. So Dr. McGew, after surgery, are there other post-surgery instructions that my teen should know? Yeah, so I think some of the big ones include do not smoke or no smoking in the first couple of days after surgery. I mean, ideally... We don't want this person smoking anyways. Can I say that? Correct. Sorry. No, absolutely. It's a public that was, service. That, That's a yeah. PSA. <laughs> I was going to say this... paying me for that. Okay. Exactly. I was going to say the same thing. I was going to say as an oral <laughs> and maxillofacial surgeon, I always recommend quitting smoking if you are a smoker. It's obviously a much harder conversation and a much harder thing to do than to just say not to smoke and get someone to quit. But I usually will try to tell patients to avoid smoking for at least the first couple of days after surgery. Does that include vaping too? Because a lot of teens and people in their early 20s, well, a lot of people vape. Is that the same thing too? Same thing. Yeah. Avoid vaping, avoid e-cigarettes, avoid any type of tobacco or smoking products, I guess is the best way to say it now, because all of that creates a change in environment in the oral cavity. It changes the the negative pressure that we create. And it's the same thing with straws for, for different reasons. Tobacco and cigarette use has some other chemicals in it that can affect healing, but also the negative pressure, the actual act of sucking on a cigarette or sucking on a straw can dislodge blood clots. And that's how you end up with the, what people call a dry socket. Okay. Dry sockets are just really painful. It's not an infection. It's not something that needs treatment. It's just very uncomfortable until that heals. And so we try to recommend avoiding those things to help minimize the risk of getting something like a dry socket. So those things don't promote healing, basically. It's smoking and straws. Correct. Well, straws, they may not necessarily affect the healing so much. But like I said, that negative suction in the mouth can dislodge the blood clots. Okay. And that can change just kind of how things heal, not necessarily if they will or won't. Right. Tobacco smoking can definitely affect healing. Alcohol can also definitely affect healing. So I recommend avoiding alcohol again for the first few days after surgery. Okay. So So if you got a kid that smokes and drinks like white claws through a straw, <laughs> that's that's real bad. We You're really, like yeah. Dr. McGee was like, yeah, okay, well, let's, we got to talk about some other things too besides the wisdom teeth, yeah. okay? Yeah, no. yeah, and obviously for some parents, we're happy that they're able to have these conversations with their kids, but for all the teenagers that maybe are listening to this and <laughs> not wanting to share that with their parents, maybe avoid those things. Or yes. for patients who are a little older and doing that on their own, you know, we would recommend avoiding those things. So. Absolutely, yeah. So do the stitches generally then dissolve on their own? Is that how it works? Exactly, yes. Most of us use dissolvable stitches, Again, one, for patient comfort, and two, for ease of care. A lot of times, patients may not have any issues and may not feel like they want to come back for a follow-up appointment, and that's one less reason that they would Mm -hmm. need to do that. Do people generally come back for a follow-up? It really depends on the provider. It depends on the patient. Often, we will either have patients follow up in a week, or we will, if things went really straightforward and we really don't expect patients to have any issues, we can tell the patient to just give us a call if they're having Mm -hmm. any questions or concerns. And... Usually when we tend to see those is about a week out, and that's often why we will give that one-week follow-up if we're going to do a follow-up appointment. Right. Yeah, that sounds great. So thank you so much for talking to us about this. As we wrap up, anything you want to add about recovering from wisdom teeth surgery? Sure, just a couple of things that I think are important to keep in mind. So sometimes patients may be concerned because they're seeing some bleeding from the mouth, but it's really very normal to have some slight oozing. I usually will tell my patients blood-tinged saliva for maybe the first 24 to 48 hours. That's pretty normal and not something to be overly concerned about. 
pain and swelling is fairly normal. That's why you're often going to be recommended to take either some over-the-counter pain medications or potentially prescribed pain medications, again, to help with the pain. Ice can be very helpful for swelling. And we, we do want you to continue your oral hygiene during those periods as well. So making sure to continue brushing and flossing, using any recommended antibiotic mouth rinses or warm salt water rinses that your surgeon may recommend. Because what I like to tell people is the best thing you can do to minimize your risk of infections and complications postoperatively or after surgery is to keep your mouth clean. So be gentle, but stay hygienic. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Miku, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, once again, that is Dr. Caitlin McGue. And for more information in the full podcast library, please visit myoms.org. And if you found this podcast helpful, please share it on your social channels. And don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for listening.